Thank you, everybody, for um, joining us today for our live webinar, which is going to be presented by Professor Nils helg Shev, entitled Quantitative Analysis of Oxylipins and the Enzymes of the Arachidonic Acid Cascade. My name is Valerie O'Donnell. I'm based at Cardiff University in the UK. Um, the webinar is, as usual, around 45 minutes, allowing 10 minutes at the end for questions. Today's webinar is being sponsored by Merck KGA Darmstadt, Germany. We're grateful for their ongoing support, and I'd like to introduce our speaker now. So, Nils... Uh, studied food chemistry and toxicology in Munster and Karlsruhe. After receiving his PhD in analytical chemistry, he was a postdoc at the University of California, Davis, and then a scientist at the University of Veterinary Medicine, Hanover. Since 2014, he's chair of food chemistry at the University of Wuppertal in Germany. Nils's team develops and applies instrumental analytical methods to provide quantitative data of metabolites and then investigates their role in physiology. And he's published more than 130 scientific publications and book chapters. Um, of note, especially today, is the method that Nils developed for oxylipin analysis, which is a comprehensive LCMS-based targeted approach. Um, you know, this, I think, I don't know when you, you first developed this, but then one of your postdocs, Sven Meckelman, came to my lab and around 2017 set it up here, which has been absolutely fantastic for us to have that assay here. We were we went from like running five or six lipids at a time to suddenly running about 103. And I'm very jealous now, yesterday on a call, I saw that you're running like 200 or something. So you've you, it's time for me to upgrade, the, to get Sven back to upgrade the assay in our lab, Nils. I think in the last six years, obviously, there's been... Uh, a huge increase maybe in the number of standards available and uh, you know we've all, all upgraded our machines as well to ones that get faster they scan the more we can measure so these assays are fantastic and we're all using them now like as as uh, you know workhorses and I, I think the version that Neil set up has been absolutely fantastic for us so I was I was just going to say uh, that I was fortunate enough to hear you recently presented a lab meeting in the hammock lab and how you've recently started looking at what's a completely under-researched area. I don't know if you're going to talk about this today, but this is about the exposure of humans to oxylipins through nutrition. Are you going to talk about this? Or am I? This will be another no. webinar, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll have to have another webinar. Right, well, Nils has published some really interesting papers recently looking at monohydroxylipids from linoleate or linolenic acids in uh, in number in many oils. And I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what they might be doing biologically. I think we're at the start of a whole new area of research there. So, Anyway, um, I should stop now and hand over. I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk, Nils. So I'll hand over to you. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to my talk. And what I really would like to focus on today is how to use the LCMS machine to analyze and understand more about the archidonic acid cascade. I'm going to present you a lot of details how to set up an LCMS method for the analysis of oxalipins. And this will be, I'm going to present a lot of details in a limited amount of time. And this meeting uh, is going to be recorded. So if it's too fast, you will have the chance to go back to one or the other slide and uh, look again on this information. So I think it's not necessary to introduce to this audience what oxalipins are, but I think it's good to, to, to spend a few words on that before we go deeply into the analysis of these compounds. And oxalipins are lipid mediators, or at least several of these oxalipins are described as potent lipid mediators, and they largely act autocrine and paracrine, which means they affect the cell which give rise to these compounds or the cell, surround, uh, the cell surrounding it. They are not so much endocrine compounds which affect the whole organism, though we analyze a lot of times these oxalipins in the central compartment like, like the plasma because we don't get other samples typically from humans. Oxalipins are formed from polyunsaturated fatty acids in the so-called archidonic acid cascade, and the best known mechanism of uh, oxalipin formation is the uh, enzymatic reaction by the two cyclooxygenases. They give rise to the instable prostaglandin H2 here, and this prostaglandin H2 can be uh, transformed by other synthetase to, to, to several prostat uh, prostaglandins, and one well-known uh, prostaglandin is, of course, PGE2, which founds its receptors on several cells in the body, causing fever and pain. Also, the blood coagulation is regulated via this pathway, and from PGH2, the thromboxane A synthetase can, uh, can form thromboxane A2, which increase the platelet uh, aggregation, and also its counterpart, the uh, prostacyclin, is formed via this pathway. 
The second pathway of the arachidonic acid cascade is catalyzed by lipoxygenase, giving rise to hydroperoxy fatty acids. And in case of a five LOX, this hydroperoxy uh, fatty acid can be further transformed to highly potent leukotrains, for example, the pro inflammatory LTB4 here, or the cysteine conjugate, the LTC4, uh, which is important in bronchoconstriction. There are also other lipoxygenases, for example, the 15 lipoxygenase giving rise to 15 and position 15 the hydroperoxylated uh, arachidonic acid and the 12 lipoxygenase. If we think about the pharmacological importance of these two pathways, for example, if you think about aspirin or uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, we really see that this is really an important pathway of formation of potent lipid mediators. However, if we think about the, uh, to understand how drugs or our diet influences the formation of lipid mediators, we have to keep in mind that the arachidonic acid cascade is more complicated than this. For example, it's since uh, about 20, 30 years, it's now well accepted that also the cytochrome P4050 enzymes play an important role in the formation of bioactive lipid mediator formation. On the one hand, 20 heti which is vasoconstrictory, can be formed, and also the epoxy fatty acids, which are vasodilatory and anti-inflammatory. And if you look at the structure from a chemical point of view, you see you don't need any enzymes to, to, to form oxidized metabolites of those. They can also react just chemically by out oxidation to hydroperoxy fatty acids, but also to isoprostan, uh, to prostate pros similar structures, the isoprostates. This becomes even more complicated schemes if you keep in mind that not only the arachidonic acid, but also other polyunsaturated fatty acids like DHA and EPA can be converted by this enzyme machinery. And so we have a lot of different metabolites which are formed within the arachidonic acid cascade. And the challenge for an analytical chemist and also for, for the biologists who have to interpret the data then is that, uh, that uh, the biological uh, uh, effects are rather mediated by a change in the pattern of the oxalipins rather by a single compound. And to understand this, we really need good analytical methods covering as many oxalipins as possible in a targeted manner so that we really get quantitative information. And as Varry said, since more than a decade, my, uh, my lab is working on that and you find here the current state of our methods, which we also summarized in this recent reviews. I also would like to draw your attention to these two book chapters. You can use this uh, uh, this website here to, to look at them, where we really summarize how to analyze uh, oxalipins. So what are the challenges if you set up an LCMS method for oxalipins? I think when we say, uh, having said that oxalipins are highly potent lipid mediators, they act in low concentrations, so we need high sensitive uh, method to be able to detect them in biological samples. However, in the same samples, we have other oxalipins which are present at much higher concentrations, so we need a large dynamic range. Then we have a lot of different analytes, which are uh, isomeric or, uh, and also isobaric. And for this, we need an excellent chromatographic separation and a specific mass spectrometric detection. So let's have a look on the chromatographic separation. As Valerie mentioned, we extended our method now covering 239 oxalipins using 29 internal standards within 30.5 minutes. And one thing which is important is something what we call a critical chromatographic separation pairs. These are compounds we cannot keep apart based on their, uh, their behavior on the mass spec, which we have to separate by means of chromatography. For example, an easy uh, critical separation pair is 12 Ht, 9 Ht. You see that 12 Ht causes a signal uh, um, uh, on, on, the, on the same transition here, like 9 Ht. So we have to key, uh, separate these two compounds by chromatography. And it's really key if you develop an, um, an LCMS method for oxalipin quantification that you know your critical separation pairs and you carefully optimize your chromatography with respect to the selection of the column, with respect to selection of the mobile phase, but also for setting up the gradient. You can really see here for the, from the example from isoprostans that it's possible by an optimized gradient to separate, for example, these two isobars here uh, uh, rapidly only within four minutes and not less than with an initial gradient within 15 minutes with a sufficient uh, chromatographic resolution. So if we think about this, that we have here a method uh, which covers a lot of different, uh, different, uh, different analytes within one minute, we have some general challenges with which occur for a multi-analyte targeted method. 
which is, of course, the time the instrument spends for the detection of one of the single compounds within this method. And even though some companies selling you mass specs try, uh, try to tell you that new instruments uh, have a really, really good signal to noise ratio at a short dwell time. So the dwell time is a time where actually the instrument measures uh, this uh, one uh, transition. You can see that even with the modern ones, the longer the dwell time is, the better the signal to noise ratio is. And if you think now about a method covering more than 250 uh, transitions, including also the internal standards, if we would think about that we monitor all these transitions uh, um, uh, uh, all the time, we would, not, uh, we would have a very, very long cycle time, which would not lead enough data points per peak. To solve this, there's, uh, there's a, a modus which is called scheduled SRM or scheduled MRM in most of the instrument software that we just can say, okay, instrument, uh, we expect the peak to, uh, to elude uh, this retention time. Then we set up a window around this peak, which is in our case, two, uh, 22 seconds in both sides, which on the one hand allows us to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to cope for small shifts in the retention time. And on the other hand, allows to look at the noise around the peak, which is important to determine the limit of of detection. The next thing is what we have to define is a cycle time. And the cycle time we have to set up for the scale reaction, uh, the reaction, a scale reaction, uh, 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 scale MRM mode is depending on the peak width. For example, in our method, the, the half, uh, the, the peak width at half maximum height is about four to five seconds. If we then say we would like to have 10 data points over this, uh, over this part of the peak, then we need at least a detection frequency of two hertz. So the maximum cycle time can be 0.4 seconds. If you do not draw, draw, put attention on this uh, aspect in the end, it could be that you don't have enough data points to integrate the peaks well. So this is really a challenge to, 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 to optimize this parameter as well to get on the one hand a sufficient signal to noise ratio, on the other hand, enough data points per peak. The second aspect is that currently only uh, triple quadruple mass spectrometers are really, uh, uh, really uh, refusable for the detection uh, of oxalipins uh, on the one hand for the, uh, because of their sensitivity, on the other hand because of their selectivity allowing to detect the compounds after fragmentation. If we look at 8 Hb and 12, uh, 12 Hb here, we see that we cannot separate them by a chromatographic method, but it's easy to keep them apart based on the different fragmentation uh, behavior. So we do detect, as I already mentioned, the compounds in the so-called selected reaction monitoring mode. So we select one ion, usually the M minus H uh, ion in negative, uh, elect uh, after negative electrospray ionization. Then we fragment these molecules and we detect a, uh, a specific fragment of the compound. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this yields together with the chromatographic separation, the selectivity we need for the detection of the oxygen pits. Let's look at this uh, uh, with an example. For example, resolvin E1, we look at the fragment spectra and we see that we have several, uh, several prominent fragments here. And then we try to select those fragments which are structurally meaningful, resulting from a fragmentation of the backbone of the molecule. Then we can look at the different peaks uh, uh, which are formed from uh, from from these different transitions, and usually for 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 for, uh, for for molecules being present in a low concentration or not being present at all, where there's a lot of discussion about these molecules, we do not ha we have one qualifier and we have uh, two qualifier and one quantifier to really be sure if there's a signal that's from this compound. And then the next step, if you have selected these transitions, it's important that you set up the, the mass spec in a way that these transitions are, um, uh, are detected with, with high sensitivity. And for this, it's important to adjust the electronic parameters of the instrument. For example, if you look here at the collision energy, if you say if you if you choose a completely uh, a wrong value, then you don't have any sensitivity at all. However, if you have a good starting point, yeah, if you have, for example, the collision energy, a good starting point in our hands of minus 22 on the instrument, the optimization yields a little bit of better signal, but overall the oxidopins behave more or less similar with respect to the uh, um, to the, to the electronic parameters in the triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. So 
The second aspect for the selection of the transition is, of course, that they should be as selective as possible. And of course, we should avoid uh, fragmentations where, uh, which are not specific, for example, the loss of carbon dioxide or the loss of water, which leads, if you, if you use this transition, as you see in exa for the example of 17-HDA in a much more noisy signal compared to a specific fragmentation from the alpha cleavage followed by, by, by the loss of carbon dioxide. And this is really a challenge to, 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 to select the uh, transition, which is on the one hand specific, on the other hand sensitive. One really advantage, uh, one big advantage if you if you uh, use several transitions per molecule is that you can calculate the ratio of these two transitions to 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 gain uh, a higher level of certainty that the, the compound is really present in your samples. If you look, for example, on these two uh, dihydroxy fatty acids uh, named NP, uh, pro protectin D1 and PDX, you see for the standards that uh, they have a specific ratio of these two ions, uh, which are formed from the, uh, from the fragmentation of the alpha cleavage at this position. If we spike then a sample yeah, with, uh, uh, with these two compounds, we see that this ratio of the two ions is not changed. And if we look in a, a real-world sample from a peritonitis patient, we see for the PDX that we still have the same ratio, yeah, which indicates that this peak could be the, the PDX compound, while we see that the ratio of these two ions is for the uh, uh, PD1 peak here totally different, indicating that it's a different compound, which gives rise to the signal. If you look then in the literature about PD-1, it's quite easy to understand what that is. Uh, if you look here at the work from Alan Bresch and co-workers, you see that aside from the compound which is suggested to be PD-1, there are several other isomers yeah, with a different configuration of this, uh, of this double bounds. And for the PD-1, it suggests that the specific enzyme, which is unknown, yeah, gives rise to this compound where we have the cis configuration of this position, that the compound we detected is probably the, the trans 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 compound because Alan Bresch could nicely show that if you use methanol as a uh, um, solvent in RP chromatography, you can separate these two compounds. And if you use acetonitrile, like we did, these two compounds co-elute, and this, this uh, ion will probably see re results from the trans 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 dihydroxy fatty acid, not from the compound which is called protectin D1. The next step after you have selected your your, tra uh, your transitions and you set up the mass spec uh, it's, uh, quite well is to define the limit of detection and quantification for a compound. Let's keep, let's let's imagine you just inject solvent and you look at your uh, at your, your signal. You will probably just see uh, see noise and the noise is really dependent uh, on, on the instrument and every signal uh, uh, every, every instrument has. If you, if you look uh, look very uh, very very closely, that uh, has some noise. If you then inject a little more than nothing, of course, you will probably uh, do, do, do not see anything. And uh, there's a, spe a specific concentration where something might start to happen. But if you look at a signal like this, it's impossible to say if it's just a slightly higher noise by accident or if it's really a compound. You can be sure that a compound is there, or, or say uh, based on the uh, chromatography, that, that, that you see the compound if the signal to noise ratio and really the unsmoothed data here, the, 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 the peak, uh, peak to peak height, yeah, uh, to, the, to the height of the, uh, of the compound peak uh, with, uh, of higher than three, then you can say the compound is there. The, this concentration is also called the limit of detection. And if you want to quantify, it's complicated to quantify such a small peak because if, if the noise is here a little bit higher, then you have a much higher area. So the quantification is possible with a higher signal to noise ratio. In our lab, we start to quantify with a signal to noise ratio, which is higher than five. And you're might aware that there, there have been a lot of discussions in the past years regarding the presence of specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators in biological samples. Uh, this discussion was largely about the, 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 the question, what kind of peaks can you integrate? And despite uh, our criticism that some of these methods are not sound, there are still peaks uh, or still groups who integrate peaks like this and claim that they have biological relevance. However, this is 
a webinar how I, uh, where I can present you how I would uh, suggest how to set up a, a sound method for, for the analyzer of oxalipins. I would really argue that it's important if you want to quantify that the signal to noise ratio is higher than five before you can even think about uh, integrating a peak. What is important if you set up your method is that you really look at these peaks from your method uh, 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 hand, uh, by hand and you don't use algorithms from the software. There are some algorithms yeah, which use some sort of, of smooth data. And if you look, for example, this is oxalipin data from a recent publication. Yeah, uh, on, the, on the height from the noise to the peak height here, you can estimate that the signal to noise ratio maybe is something like three or maybe four. But you see that this algorithm calculates a signal to noise ratio of more than 10. Of course, you can calculate uh, all the signal to noise ratios you would like to have, but if you use this kind of algorithms, we have to increase the number of signal to noise ratio, which is required for quantification then as well. So if you if you want to use the signal to noise ratio of five, it's really important to use unsmooth data. For quantification, I think it's not only important that you have a qualitative criterion, it's also important to have a quantitative one, and we only use calibration points where the accuracy is within 20%. And the concept of accuracy is really something which I only see rarely in the, the field of oxalipin analysis, but it's so easy and I really would like to, uh, to encourage you to use it. If you have a calibration, you can easily use your calibration function to calculate based from the, uh, from the analyte ratio in your standards, the concentration, and then compare this concentration to the concentration of your, your standard, and then calculate your accuracy and only use calibration points with a within 20% of, uh, of the expected concentration. As I said, this, this is really rarely presented in bio, uh, biological methods. And instead, sometimes the people show their, their R value or their R square value, and they seem to be proud if they have a value of 0.9999. But this actually says nothing, same like this calibration line. If you have a, a, a calibration line like this, you don't see the low concentration. We are typically interested in the low concentrations here. If you want to plot something, then it's better to use a log log plot. Then you already see that something is not OK here. And what is not OK here that in this calibration function, we did not weight by concentration. And for the linear regression, it's really important that you use a weighting by one by uh, by the con one by x of the concentration or one by x square. Otherwise, the low concentrations are not, uh, not well taken into account by the regression. And this is uh, here an example for PGE2. If you don't use, uh, use any weighting, then the, the, the accuracy is really bad for the low concentration, while with the same data set, you can easily quantify down to 0.13 nanomolar using, uh, using a correct, uh, correct regression. And I think it's important that you include this kind of data also in your manuscript that you can really show that your calibration works well. What is also important, in addition to the lower limit of quantification, is to define the upper limit of quantification. Either the highest standard you inject and the highest concentration you quantify, or look what your instrument can do. We used to have a 6,500 Q-trap instrument there. We never hit the upper limit of quantification. But when we, when we went down from the 6,500 to the 5,500, we found something which looks like a fork for, uh, for fries when we injected higher concentrations. And the reason is that the detector can be easily saturated. So the calibration curves look then somehow like this. And as a rule of a thumb, one can say the 5000 series has four orders of magnitude linear range and the 6000 series five orders of magnitude linear range. However, if you need a larger like, calibration range, there's a simple trick what you can use. You can uh, add a second transition for these compounds with an offset in the CE. Just using a higher CE, giving rise to less ions, so the detector is not so easily saturated. So we have a second calibration uh, for, for, for the high concentration level so that it's possible to quantify low abundant lipids and high abundant lipids within the same sample. Okay, so this brings me to the first summary. 
yeah, I, I hope I could show you uh, some details how to set up the instrumental parameters for oxalipin analysis. In the end, we end up typically with a limit of the uh, limit of uh, limit of quantification around one picogram on sample, depending on the compound. Some are a little more sensitive, some are a little bit less sensitive, depending on the ionization efficacy and the fragmentation behavior. However, I think a much larger challenge than setting up the method is really to understand how to get the biological sample into the mass spec. And if we think about a liquid sample like plasma, then we can uh, start directly with a sample preparation by solid phase extraction. If we have a tissue, we first have to extract and homogenize the tissue. This is a scheme how we uh, how we uh, how we perform the solid phase extraction in our lab in detail. But I think for this talk, it's more important that that, that I explain to you a little bit the the, the 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 main concept. So we have here the liquid sample or the tracks extracted and homogenized biological tissue. Then we put it on the SPE cartridge. We wash the SPE cartridge. Polar compounds are washed to waste, and then we use a specific elution solvent, eluting the oxalipins, but not the non-polar stuff, which we don't want to have, which should stick on the column, then evaporate the samples, reconstitute the sample, and inject it into the LCMS systems. Two aspects are here important. On the one hand, the concentration factor. So if you start with 500 microliters of human plasma and end up with 50 microliters, we gain tenfold of sensitivity. And the second thing is how much of our initial sample ends up in the mass spec. So here it's, uh, it's, it's 20 percent, which ends up in the mass spec, two aspects which are important to optimize if you want to have a really sensitive method for the detection of oxalipins and biological samples. And one aspect which I really would encourage everybody to, to do is to reconstitute in the end the, uh, the, the extract in a second set of internal standards. Then you can use the second set of internal standards yeah, uh, to quantify the amount of internal standards in your sample. And then you can use this amount of internal standards as a quality control for each extracted sample. When we started doing this and we started uh, our method using uh, polymer phases for solid phase extraction, we figured out that the internal standard recovery for some, some internal standards like 9 Hodi here was really poor. Then we ask ourselves why that is, and we edit the internal standard first before the SPE, as we typically do this, and then after the solid phase extraction step, and we figured out that we still had the same problems. So we had the hypothesis that this is caused by iron suppression. And if you think about iron suppression, it's, uh, it's important to carry out iron suppression analysis. Here you can inject the matrix, so you extract a sample without internal standard, and then post columnly infuse a constant flow of your internal standards. If there's no matrix eluting, then you have a constant signal of your internal standards. And if there's matrix interfering with the, with the ionization of your compounds, you really see a breakdown of the signal. And by doing this ion suppression analysis, we could really nicely show that there, there was a strong ion suppression in the signal after solid phase extraction using these cartridges, which is probably due to phospholipids, which are co-extracted. And this is the reason we switched and optimized a different SPE protocol using a mixed mode uh, anion exchange uh, LPR18 um, uh, cartridge, where we really have a very good ion suppression profile giving um, uh, uh, yielding really good recovery rates of our internal standards, which are quite constant. So typically, we have uh, we have uh, recovery rates over 70%. If they are lower, we really have to check if the extraction of the sample uh, work well. I think the extraction recovery is not so important. What is more important is that the method really works stable over time. And it's important that we include quality control samples and we have a set of quality control plasma, which is plasma which we aliquoted in a large batch in our lab. And we monitor the concentration of the oxalipins over time. And you can see that our method really works stable over years for analytes being present in the samples. And of course, oxalipins, which are not present in biological samples, will when we spike them to the samples. So the method really works well and is quite robust. What is important is that it's hard to say if we are really accurate with our method and it could be easy be the case that we are just that we're quite precisely off because we use wrong uh, or we use 
not, uh, not, not proper ex external standards. You know, there are only few companies selling us the standards we use for quantification, and they sometimes have really varying quality. Sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less. And uh, this is the reason we started to check the concentration of all these standards. And a few years ago, there were some mass spec certified standards which became uh, available, but only for a few compounds. And to, to, to qualify the other compounds with a few compounds, we came up with a strategy using the LCMS in the selected ion monitoring mode. So this means we detect the compounds without fragmentation, just the M-H uh, ion, and we can assume that the different regular isomers here have the same ionization efficacy, and therefore same concentration should yield the same peak area and if you see that something is really off here even uh, uh, higher or lower then we know that the standard probably has not a good quality and in case of compounds like 15 HT, we can also use the uv absorption to support this data from the lc um, uh, lc sim analysis and there we are in this paper we suggested some rules how we how you can uh, how you can qualify your standards if you have a certified M a mass spec standard for the same compound we uh, we calculate correction factors uh, starting uh, if, the, if the if the area is, uh, is is off more than 20% and if you use regular isomers or we use, uh, use use certified standards from the same class we start using correction factors um, uh, if the if the, com if, the co if the area or the absorption is uh, is off of more than 30% and if you uh, would ask me how many in our experience, how many of the standards have a concentration what, which we need to correct, I would say one in th one in, out of 30 is uh, not labeled correctly. It needs to be corrected. And I think this is really an issue we have in the field that we really need certified standards that we can compare our methods. So if we think about oxalipin analysis, I talked uh, so far about the detection of the compounds as such. However, in case of epoxy fatty acids and, uh, and uh, dihydroxy fatty acids, the major portion of this oxalipins is present in esterified form in biological samples, for example, in the cell membrane. If we want to detect them, we first have to liberate them from the from, uh, from, 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 from the lipids, and this is typically carried out by uh, by saponification using a base like potassium hydroxide. This is indeed a delicate step. It's really uh, we really spend a lot of time to set up these conditions, yielding here uh, reproducible and, uh, and good recovery rates of the esterified oxalipins, where we first precipitate the proteins, then hydrolyze the samples, then neutralize it. And if we use this procedure, we really get good recovery rates of the internal standards. And uh, a detailed uh, standard operation procedure, how to do that, can be found, found in this paper. Using this procedure, we performed an international laboratory compersion. And here we provided, on the one hand, the, the, the already mentioned standard operation procedure, also verified standards, so that it was not a matter of the calibration curve where we see differences. And then we com compared uh, labs in, uh, in France, in, uh, in the United States, and in Germany for the, uh, for the results of the oxalipin analysis. First, what we saw is that it's possible if you use the same protocols for most of the labs really to do, uh, do the oxalipin analysis with a low variation, which was for a lot of analytes between 15%. And what we saw is that the epoxy fatty acid showed the highest variation. We figured out later on why that was because uh, this is because in after saponification, epoxy fatty acid can be artificially formed on SPE cartridges, which have a silica, uh, which are silica based. So we switched recently to cartridges which are polymer based. So there is no artificial formation of epoxy fatty acid. But more important, I think, than the variation is the questions, do these different labs detect the same differences in oxalipin levels? So typically, we have a disease condition and a healthy condition, and we compare oxalipin levels to understand the role of oxalipins in a disease. And here we, uh, we, we provided the lab different, different samples. For example, here plasma from obese patients and he obese healthy patients. Here plasma from obese patients with hypertrosylemia. And if we look at the difference which were detected in the different labs, 
we figured out that, uh, that uh, among the oxalipins, 92% found a similar change between the different labs. So the results were with, the biological, uh, with respect to the biological outcome comparable. What is another challenge, another challenge for, 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 for oxalipin analysis is that these lipid mediators can be degraded and they can be formed after sample collection. So we uh, we really had a look on the uh, on the changes during the pre-analytics of the oxalipins, and we try to mimic what happens if you analyze clinical samples or samples from uh, animal experiments. So if somebody, uh, if a clinician or, or a person working uh, with the animals collects the samples, they typically do not have the time to, 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 to do the centrifugation right away. So sometimes the sample um, sits for a while in the, in the lab before it's uh, further processed. Then after the centrifugation, the sample can, uh, can, can wait a while on the lab bench. And then in the end, there might be an intermediate storage before the sample end up in the minus 80 freezer. So we came up with this pr procedure here with different times of storage before the samples were finally uh, stored at minus uh, 80 degree in the freezer. To our own surprise, we figured out that the total oxalipins were quite stable regarding the changes during, during the pre-analytics. As you see here, all these changes, all these different storages had only minor influences on the, on the level of 5-ET and other hydroxy fatty acids in the sample, only if you combine all these things, meaning that the sample was uh, sitting not uh, under not well-controlled well control conditions for 151 hours, yeah, then we see a strong increase here. Again, we had some, yeah, some issue with the epoxy fatty acid uh, levels, but this is uh, due, as I already said, to the SPE procedure, which is now with a mixed mode uh, uh, phase based on polymers, not, not longer the case. What is also interesting is that if we keep the samples at minus 80 degree, it's possible to get reproducible results over a storage period for more than four years, and there's no strong change uh, of, the of the total oxalipin levels in plasma if the samples are stored at minus 80 degree. And this is good news if you analyze cohorts or things like that, where the samples sometimes are stored much longer than four years in a minus 80 degree freeze. This is true for total oxalipins. If we think about free oxalipins, the situation is different. There we carried out a similar experiment, but we went closer to the clinic. So we went to the medical uh, school uh, in Hanover, and there they have a pneumatic tube system transport. So the, uh, at the site of collection, the, the blood is put in this pneumatic tube transport system. And a few minutes later, the tube, uh, tube, uh, tube appears at the, at the lab, uh, in, the, in the center lab of, the, of, the, of, the, of this uh, clinic. And then we looked at the effects of storage at room temperature and also of this pneumatic transport. And we could really see that, for example, for PGE2, for 5 heat deformation, we really see effects of the uh, of the uh, of 12 heat deformation and PGE2. So, uh, so far from the uh, from the platelet acti activation, also we see really that the free oxalipins are uh, strongly influenced if the sample uh, collection procedure is not carried out in a controlled manner. Okay. So um, let's let's sum this uh, a little up. What I already showed you, I showed you that we can use LCMS analysis on the one hand to analyze free oxalipins by solid phase extraction of the uh, of the sample where, uh, after protein precipitation, or we can uh, can perform first the, uh, the the alkaline hydrolysis to release it, uh, the, the, the the total uh, the release the bound oxalipins to calculate the level of the esterified oxalipins. Of course, we can also use aliquots of these solutions to calculate the concentration or to measure the concentration of the fatty acids, enabling, for example, to calculate the ratio of the fatty acids to the oxalipins, which is important sometimes if you, if you look at, uh, at studies where we, uh, where we modulate the, 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 the amount of fatty acids by nutrition. And something which is also important is to ask how do the changes in the oxalipin pattern occur? And if you think about this, of course, the level of the enzymes involved in their formation is really important. And typically, this is carried out by Western blood. And this is like, like, like two techniques from, from different centuries. We have the highly modern LCMS analysis for quantitative results. And then we use a Western blood to determine the protein amount. And here we developed recently a strategy also using LCMS to analyze 
the expression of the uh, of the enzymes of the archidonic acid cascade. And the nice thing is that we can really use the very same sample and we use what we, for, uh, what we throw beforehand to waste the protein pellet here for the analysis of the proteins of the archidonic acid cascade. And to analyze these proteins, which are huge, they, they have a weight of 60 kilodalton or more, we cannot analyze them as such. We, uh, we, we, we digest, them for, digest them first using trypsin, then we end up with peptides, which behave like the small molecules we, 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 we are used to quantify, for example, like our oxalipins. So we use LCMS analysis with external calibration, and we can quantify the enzymes. Let's look at an example. For example, if we look at the triptych digest of uh, cyclooxygenase 2, we can do this uh, in silico just uh, by, by thinking about the, 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 the way where trypsin cleaves the protein and the sequence of the enzyme. And then we can select based on this possible peptides. And for the selection, of course, it's important that we have a sufficient length of the, of the, of the peptides, that we have a unique sequence. We choose a peptide unless we are interested in polymorphisms where no polymorphisms occur. We have no translational modifications and no unstable uh, amino acids. And in case of COX, applying this criteria, we, uh, we found six suitable peptides. So we, we order these peptides. There are companies selling you, uh, selling you peptides if you just send them the sequence. And then we, uh, we check which peptides uh, uh, are suited best for the analyze and figured out that two, well, these two here were really, uh, were really, really, good, really good for the quantification of COX in biological samples. And we also found one nice peptide here, which enables the parallel quantification of COX-1 and COX-2 in one sample. And this we did for all the enzymes of the archidonic acid cascade. And if you look at this chromatogram, it looks a lot like the chromatogram for the oxalipin analysis. And we have now this uh, seven enzymes of the archidonic acid cascade with two peptides per protein and three transitions per peptide um, uh, in our method. And with respect to the Sensitivity, uh, analyzing this in easy positive mode and uh, having this well ionizable peptides, the limit of quantification is much better with 0.0, uh, um, uh, 0 0.02 uh, picogram on column. But if you calculate back to the uh, amount of protein, it's again in the picogram range because uh, the proteins are rather large. And to show you what you can do with this method, I have some some nice time time concentration resolved uh, uh, um, data from from the modulation of the iodonic acid cascade. Here we used uh, here with THP one cells, and uh, and uh, these cells were differentiated, and then we stimulated these cells with LPS. And we can really see in a time-resolved manner how the Cox expression in, is induced by LPS from not being detectable up to, to, to the maximum around eight hours. And this is true quantitative data compared to a Western blot. And we can also do this if we, for example, reduce the, the, the COX activity by dexamethasone. And we can really see these two dose response curves giving uh, almost the same IC50, really showing that dexamethasone is what we knew before, not an inhibitor of COX, but reducing the expression of COX2. Okay. So this brings me to the end. I could, uh, I hope I could show you that LCMS is really a powerful tool to allow uh, to monitor the archidonic acid cascade. And we developed an approach allowing from a single sample free and total oxalipin analysis, the analysis of total uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid and free unsaturated fatty acid, and also of the enzyme of the archidonic acid cascade. And this method is well suited to understand the changes of oxalipins during disease by pharmacological intervention and also how the nutrition modulates oxalip information. I know this was a lot of information in a limited amount of time, and I would like to draw your attention to our webpage, which is, which is Labchem at Univopatal. There you can go to the, the part of the website uh, from my group. If you then press the research button, you will find a section which is called Quantitative Analyze of Oxalipins. Here we nicely summarize all the information I just told you, including all the PDFs of the publications. You also find it here uh, using, uh, using, using this code. And uh, I would like to thank our collaboration partners helping us to, to get all this data about the oxalipins. And I would like to thank the former PhD students who really contributed a lot to the method development in the past 10 years. And of course, I would like you to, for your, uh, to thank you uh, for your attention. 
Thank you, Nils. That was great. So we have a number of questions. Um, I have one, but I'll wait till after. So the first is um, Miguel. Yes, hello. Thank hello. you, Nils. Nils, that was spectacular, as I expected. <laughs> That's a, that's beautiful work, and it's a it's a very nice summary. I just have a quick question. I think we all we all understand the importance of defining correct signal to noise mm -hmm. uh, numbers for LODs and LOQs. And there is one thing that Val insists often, and she's absolutely right, and is that uh, we need to be aware that all of these should be done with unsmooth peaks. But uh, my, my question is something that I I never read anywhere and is that signal to noise ratio is calculated with a time window and i think that one should be defined either as an absolute time in numbers of seconds or minutes or a percentage of the total chromatography time because we are probably all aware of some popular software that reports signal to noise ratios incredibly high that nobody would accept when looking at the peak. So uh, do you think there is a, um, have you thought about this and is there an easy way to define, well, we should all use a time window of one minute or two minutes or or whatever that may be. Thank you. Actually, yeah, I think this is a really important question. Which section of the chromatogram do we use to, to look for the noise, to define what is actually the noise level? I think if we if we look for a blank injection, we can just use the 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 the, the, the time where the peak uh, where the peak would elude. So so the very very time where where the, uh, where, where, the, where we have the peak and in the blank we don't have the peak plus the same time before and after the peak. This would be a practical approach, but I'm not aware that there's some sort of guideline how long this section needs to be. I would just say it needs to be representative. And if you if you if you if you want to show transparent data, I think it's good to just show how it was calculated in the supplementary material of uh, of your methods. Then everybody can see how you decided to define what the representative noise in your chromatogram is. I I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, the thing about the blank nils though is that a blank might not won't have the same matrix background as your samples. So then there's the trick. The, uh, so yeah, being really transparent and showing it. Um, I mean, nothing can beat our eyes when it looks at this. But as part of the the guideline group, this is going to be something we're going to discuss more. I'm sure. And if we can find a solution to it, great. But yeah, maybe there isn't an obvious one to this. Um, Miguel, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, we can go on to. Um, Brendan. I've done that. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Neil, so much for that talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, my question, Nils, is concerning the acidification of your samples before, before performing the extraction. How critical is it to acidify the sample to a certain pH? And um, so I'm, I'm used to seeing pH is between three and four. Um, so is there something specific that should be aimed for? Uh, and do you recommend any... Uh, any chemical, because I know there's a certification that's performed with acetic acid, some with hydrochloric acid. Just wanted to get your take on this. Thank you, Niels. Mm -hmm. So, so I think with respect to it, it really depends on the solid phase extraction you're doing. If you just do pure RP chromatography for solid phase extraction, of course, you want to have your fatty acid being protonated. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, so you you want to have a lower pH. If you use our, our mixed mode uh, cartridge, we would like to have them uh, um, also like be, be being uh, being being deprotonated the, the conjugated base. So the pH should be slightly higher. So it really depends uh, on the SPE and it, it needs to be mm -hmm. optimized. Mm -hmm. However, I would be careful with strong acids, to be honest, yeah? Because yeah. if you don't want to go down to one, and I don't see a reason why you want to go down to pH one, yeah? I would recommend staying with organic acid, having a buffer capacity at around three or four pH, because if you go to too uh, to low with the pH, you might degrade compounds like epoxy fatty acids, which are then hydrolyzed to dihydroxy ones. Thank you, Neil. Okay, so Ben, go yeah, ahead. So, uh, I still have a good question regarding the uh, when we calculate accuracy. So uh, in the accuracy uh, equation, so there's a concentration of atoms. I just confused what it's that for. Uh, 
I got that you have a question regarding uh, re regarding the calculation of accuracy, and this is just you, cal you calculate the, the the concentration you get with your with your with your regression formula, and then you compare the concentration in your standard, and this is what I call edit. Yeah, I think uh, in the formula. Yeah, so the the concentration you 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 have uh, in your standard, and the concentration you calculate, and this. Different, uh, this gives you the accuracy of the, uh, of the calibration point. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna, Nicola. Neil, such great talk. Thank you so, so much. I mean, one thing is a great comfort to see that kind of 20 years after we published similar protocols, you come back and say, uh, you, re you reiterate the rules that we have to follow and you simply very clear and very clearly show that it's not the fancy mass spectrometers that give you the quality of the results. We need to follow guidance in terms of how we measure compounds, how we assign peaks, how we identify peaks, the signal to noise ratio is paramount and everything. So thank you so very much for reviewing what we know now and make sure all the principles we all stand by uh, we still, they still have to be followed. So along these lines, uh, I'd like us to talk a bit more about the addition of antioxidants and the potential problems these may have. Um, to give you a couple of examples, uh, BHT, anytime we added it into any sample that went close to any mass spectrometer caused massive matrix effects. So we've never been able to use BHT in uh, any LCMS MS protocols uh, and get decent data. And the second point is, I know a lot of people tend to add methanol or any other organic solvents in their samples, uh, aiming to preserve them better. Again, it's something that whenever we got samples from other labs preserved this way, we never had any good quality data. So. I'd really like your thoughts on those two questions and how you have addressed them. Mm -hmm. So, so let's start off with the methanol questions. I know that there, there are several reports in literature saying that the oxalipins are more stable if we add right away some methanol, we put them in the minus 80 freezer. This seems to be good data, but in our hands, this is not, not feasible in most of the studies because we get this sample from a, clini a clinical study or so, and yes. then, there, then there are pure plasma and there's no methanol added. And I would never ever defreeze them or uh, thaw them to add methanol and then freeze them again. This would uh, would be worse than just keeping that minus 80 degree. But there is some data in the literature that, that methanol is beneficial. However, we never compared this systematically. What we compared to systematically was that we looked at all the additives and like EDTA, BHA, BHT, yes. and, and we, we looked at the effects on, 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 the, on, the, on the artificial formation of oxalipins, and we found that most of them have minor effects. So it's so, so, so reduced the amount. I think we add, and I know it's a little bit embarrassing that I don't know this in my, in my mind, we add a little BHA or BHT, which helps to prevent artificial formation. And then we add directly with the sample preparation, some inhibitors. For example, we add TPPU and SEH inhibitor to prevent that the residual TPPU activity during sample homogenization to, uh, degrades the epoxy fatty acids. We also have, I think, uh, endometacine in it just to, to prevent a residual COX activity. Mm -hmm. But with respect to the antioxidants, I would say most of the antioxidants I used to add to the samples based on my experience in other labs were removed later on. However, it's really difficult. It depends on your sample. If you have a sample which is strongly out oxidized before you get it in your lab. So some, some samples, nice, yes. they, they, then, then it can be worse. But if you have yeah. a sample which is um, well of good quality, I think, or there's a, not a sample where, where strong oxidative stress occurred. I mean, we can also interpret this biologically. Yeah. Then, then the antioxidants might help more. So yes, and Great, no. yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad you. I'm, I'm glad you shared your thoughts. Yes, I, I would agree to most of these things. Right. Thanks again, Neil. Thanks. Thanks, Val. Thanks, Anna. Um, Oswald Quellenberg. This is Asi Quellenberg. I'm calling from University of California, San Diego. Um, I enjoyed this talk very much. Thank you. I have a follow-up question on the stability of the oxalipins. I mean, we did a similar study that you did several years ago uh, and published it, I don't know, 20, in 2018 or, or so. 
uh, in which we looked at the total oxylipins in human plasma and very other biological matrices. Mm -hmm. And like you, we had to employ a hydrolysis step. And what we found that many of the oxylipins did not survive the hydrolysis step. I mean, all the prostaglandins were more or less destroyed. Yeah. Uh, like you, we found all the hydroxyphalias. And so I was wondering, how do you how do you deal with this and how do you handle the instability of the samples of the met metabolites after the hydrolysis step? Mm -hmm. yeah, first of all, I'm really honored that, that you listened to my talk. I really am aware about your methods and I think you're one of the few people who really published a validated method for the for the total oxalipins and I really like this work. And um, yeah, as you said, we degrade a lot of compounds where, while we do this uh, alkaline hydrolysis, but up to now we don't have another chance. So we are currently trying to, uh, to use enzymes to be less harsh with the samples to release the oxalipins from, from the lipids. We are also trying to detect the, the, the uh, oxidized phospholipids as such, which is also a huge challenge. But up to now, we can only detect those which are stable, like, like the hydroxy ones, like the epoxy ones. But prostaglandins, most of the prostaglandins are just gone if we apply this harsh uh, uh, alkaline conditions. So we, it's really important only to look at those analytes which are stable after the treatment with a base. OK. We've, we've used we've used a PLA two uh, nils with mm -hmm. platelets and it worked. I mean, it doesn't didn't work hundred percent, but it gave enough signal that we could measure the products. Like I yeah. can't remember the level of hydrolysis; it wasn't as complete, mm -hmm. but um, it certainly gave us products back. Um, yeah. But of course, you can analyze them as intact molecules anyway. You don't need to hydrolyze them. Yeah, so, yeah but I mean, this is really an important step forward that we find enzymes. Yeah, where we have have a characterized uh, approach where we can at least recover, let's say, 80-90% of the esterified oxalipins being, well, uh, with conditions where we do not have artificial formation and degradation of those. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it depends on what you want to measure, because when you hydrolyze, you lose information about what they were attached to. Yeah. But if you want to look at 200 oxylipins, you you know, trying to look at all of them attached to all of their larger functional groups becomes like, what, a thousand molecules in one sample. So, you know, we, we pick a few heats and we look at what they're attached to, whereas you're going the other way and broadening it right out. So I guess... Yeah, you know. So um, I, I've got a question before so, we finish. The oh, sorry. Yeah, can, can, can I can I interrupt? Yes. Uh, because you mentioned you mentioned the, the 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 measurement of the intact molecule, and I know yeah. that work. I think you did it with uh, with Murphy, where you measured, I believe, prostaglandin D two mm. attached to phospholip is correct. Yeah. But you cannot you cannot you cannot differentiate between prostaglandin D two and E two, can you? Oh God, I'm trying to remember. I think we we saw for one phospholipid we would see three peaks, and uh, I I think the D2 and E2 were co-eluting. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But there was other stuff that had the same, you know, 351 ion, but then had different daughter ions mm -hmm. and turned out to be different lipids and and whatever. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, that is true. Um, do you so have, we do you have combination a... of approaches, I guess. We need to do both really to be okay. able to have both aspects of this. Um. Nils, just to finish up. Oh, sorry, Ozzy, do you want to ask one more question and then I'll... Yeah, no, do you, uh, one, one, one more question then. Yeah, go for it. Do you, have, do you have a good protocol for the measurement of bound oxalipins by, by measuring the intact molecule? For phospholipids? Yeah, we've, we've yeah. done a lot of that. Okay. okay, okay. I have to look it up. Yeah, yeah, we'll get in touch. Yeah, that would, that would be nice to chat about it. Um, mm. Reverse phase methods, generally. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Nils, I've got a kind of an overarching question about this. So the assay you have is absolutely brilliant, and it's sort of ver going towards a clinical assay in the sense of, you know, clinical assays are massively validated in, in other ways. But this is really heading in that direction a long way down the line. And um, in, in relation to clinical utility of measuring oxylipins, I mean, are they, you know, I, I, I sometimes think they're anytime there's an inflammatory challenge, prostaglandins are going to go up. Anytime there's TH2 in immunity or whatever, IL-4, you know, you get the heats from 15 locks. And I suppose, do we have kind of any clear clinical conditions where one or two of these gives a signature that could be measured clinically? Or are we are we far from that? Do we think that that's never going to be the case just because they're, they're so dynamically responding to inflammation in general, these things, aren't they, that they may not be specific enough? Or I don't know, what are your thoughts on that big question? 
I still hope that we have this, uh, or that we discover those oxalipins, yeah. But but uh, but you're right. It's it's um it's it's not like C-reactive protein or something like this where we have something from from being a very low number going up to a really really high number. We have like changes with it which are two, three, four fold, which makes it more complicated to measure it. But I still believe that we that there are specific oxalipins for specific conditions which tell us a lot of a biology if it's in the end a, a good parameter to 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 for diagnostic purposes this i think is uh, difficult to estimate which one do you think it might be and in what disease if you're going to put that provocative statement out there tell me what your <laughs> limit of choice maybe, in disease maybe it's is. too early to 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 to, to tell them <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we're we're finished today. Thank you for an excellent talk. Thanks to everybody for coming, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye now. Bye.